this week on the Backtable podcast. So I have zero interest in creating a PDF form that is shown to be signed. Like that is not something that wakes me up in the morning. That is a functional thing. It, it does not have any impact. The impact here is giving clinicians and patients a platform that supports conversations, support that kind of shared understanding so that patients have something they can say, actually, yeah, that kind of marries with what I've kind of been discussing. I can go back to it. I can deep dive into it. I can kind of see this in my own like, language and like clearly described for me. I can deep dive a little bit more. I can go into you know reading resources from other trusted sources that I want to. I can deep dive into a video and animation. I can actually get to grips with this decision because you know my pet hate is that patients not because they don't want to engage with the decision but feel they can't. Welcome to Backtable Innovation. You can find all our previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and at backtable.com. This is the next installment of Backtable Innovation, where we'll learn from physicians and entrepreneurs working to drive healthcare forward. My name's Deanna, and I'll be your host this week, alongside my co-host, Eric Keller. On today's episode, we'll be welcoming Daph Lauren, CEO and founder of Concentric Health, a digital health solution that's revolutionizing the process of consent and facilitating informed decisions through digital tools. So we'll jump right in. Great to have you on the show, Dav. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, so I'm Dav, uh, CEO at Concentric, but very much a clinician by background. So I was a, a surgical trainee in Wales in the United Kingdom. And this has been a very much a journey of lots of little, little steps. So uh, I did undergraduate medicine in Cardiff, did four or five years as a kind of foundation trainee in the UK and then surgical training before having the opportunity to kind of just, you know, bit by bit sidestep out of the normal clinical kind of pathways. So I come from a reasonably techie family. And so even as an early you know, junior doctor would always be tinkering with little things on the wards thinking, you know, could I build something to help me in, you know, in this little thing. And, and, and there were quite a few little projects that I kind of played around with. And at that point, that uh, clinical community of people doing things in a, in a kind of techie world was so small that even if you were doing something totally teeny tiny, you know, handful of people using it, people ended up knowing about that. And so that gave me a few opportunities to kind of pitch and, and share the idea, share, sh you know, share some ideas that I was playing around with, which basically got to me to the point of, of saying, well, you know, I wonder if there's some interesting things I could do in terms of pathways, had no grand plan, had no kind of thoughts of what that would look like, but it ended up doing a, a sidestep into like innovation in, and informatics as a year within my training program. Um, and then went on to do a, a few different things in, in health tech before having the opportunity to come back and take on what became Concentric. And we'll kind of touch on a little bit more details of, of that, but you know, the idea that I kept coming back to um, and have been super fortunate over the last few years to have the opportunity to go and make that a real thing. Great. Really excited to learn more about Concentric. We've got Eric here, an expert in uh, applied ethics in IR. So do you want to just jump in, Eric? My background is being trained as, a, as an ethicist, particularly folks more in procedural specialties. You know, it sounds like you said you, you kept coming back to this idea of Concentric really trying to elevate consent. What was the origin story of that? What, what, what is it, I guess, about consent bothered you that needed fixing? I feel like that's a good starting point. There's a lot of things about yeah. everyday consent that bothers me, but I want to hear from you. Yeah. So essentially, as my second year postgraduate, um, I was posted to a to a hospital in, in North Wales called Wrexham. And on that job, so it was an orthopedics job. And I remember the first Wednesday morning, I saw the team and to all extent of purposes, was told that my role on that firm was to consent to the patients for orthopedic procedures. And I just remember thinking, I did two weeks of orthopedics in med school. I have absolutely no idea what some of these procedures were. And it was as simple as that, me saying, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I don't have the skills or knowledge to be able to have meaningful, useful conversations with patients about these procedures. Yes, I can get them to sign a consent form. I can probably you know, make them do that but purely as a, t a box ticking exercise. And I just thought that was just wrong, right? It just, it, it felt totally the wrong thing for me as a, as a clinician to be doing. So I basically just said, well, 
I don't want to be having those conversations from an ill-informed perspective. So in my evenings and weekends, I would start building a resource of information. So basically an aid memoir for my own use that I could refer to when someone said, right, you know, have a consent conversation with this person about having an IM, you know, tibial nail or whatever that I could refer back to, spend a couple of minutes just, you know, bringing myself up to speed based off, you know, this resource that I had written so that I could then go into having that conversation and hopefully add some value and not just get a signature on a consent form. And so that was literally it. Was, there was no business intent. There was a pure me solving a discomfort on my own part. Yeah, it's, at that time, it was, it was quite rare. For, so this was 2012, 2013. It was pretty unusual for clinicians to have mobile phones in the ward. They just started bringing in some of the, the textbooks on mobile phones, but it was still pretty unusual. So I was definitely in the minority of people using a mobile phone for anything kind of day to day on the ward. Clearly that's, you know, totally different now, 10 years down the line, but it was unusual enough that whenever I would, you know, spend those two minutes reminding myself of, you know, important things to discuss, risks, useful kind of FAQ type stuff that people would ask me, oh, Dav, like before you go and have those conversations with patients, like, what are you doing on your phone? Like almost like, why are you using your phone? Like, get back to work. And so I would say, well, actually, I just, I've got this resource that I've started populating and I was going, you know, going from job to job at doing different specialties. And so building this resource for my own use. And gradually over that time, people would say, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's useful. Like, could we add some of our stuff on there? Or actually, can, can I get my juniors to have access to that? Or can we add some of our specialty information on there? So totally organic, and, and this was you know very small scale, but it just meant that there was this cohort initially in in Wales of junior doctors who had something that they could easily refer to, which was tailored in a way that made sense, was quick to glance at, was tailored basically at the the kind of key things you needed for that consent conversation. Well, should we go? Maybe we should just go there. Like maybe we should start, you know, launch into concentric and you know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there was these first couple of years of playing around with some things, concentric as it now became, but it had a different name at the time, was one of those ideas that was enough to make me go and say, maybe I want to do something slightly different in terms of my career path. Went and did this year in as a leadership fellow in the NHS in the UK. And that was a bit of both of kind of leadership theory, but also some informatics work. So I did some kind of concrete informatics projects around triage between primary care, family physicians, and into secondary care, into, into kind of acute hospitals. Really interesting year. I was given a huge amount of flexibility to explore different things. And off the back of that was hired to Babylon Health, were at the time a kind of reasonably early stage virtual GP and were very much, you know, early in the field of, of telemedicine and, and virtual GPs and were totally pushing the boundary in the UK. So it was, had always been a controversial place to kind of go, but it was certainly an, an exciting opportunity that came my way off the back of some of the work that I did during that year within informatics. So I went to Babylon for a couple of years initially as one of their kind of AI fellows and then became a clinical product owner for, for one part of that AI chatbot. Super interesting year, challenging at times, challenging as a clinician at times, and probably a decent number of listeners to this podcast will know, you know, certainly the more the later part of Babylon's story and, and the fun and games of the, the SPAC and delisting that's happening. But my experience of that was, you know, Babylon going from 80 or so people to 800 people, just the simple fact of seeing an organization go through that change and everything that brings was a very interesting place to work. And I think very valuable to me in terms of learning good and bad of what I wanted to do next. And essentially concentric was, so consent and shared decision-making was that idea that we kept coming back to. So we kept tinkering, doing little bits of it, going for different grants, trying things. Basically none of them came off. Like we applied for loads of grants and generally didn't get them. And then one Friday evening uh, in October, 2018, I remember at 5.30 PM having an email saying, yep, you've got a half a million pound grant to go and make this thing a reality. And, you know, that is such a moment, right? It's just like this idea that we'd kind of been playing with. I never really thought it would come to anything because it, it by this point, had been, you know, six years of 
doing teeny tiny things, lots of false starts, lots of maybe thinking it would come to something. And then having this grant to say, actually, we believe that A, there's a, there's a space to digitally transform this process, that this paper process around consent. But by this point, there was some more maturity around the other things that that would allow us to do. So the opportunity around shared decision-making and, and bringing patients really into these decisions and in, in a meaningful way. Super exciting. Um, what, what did your team do? Like what was, when you received that email, you got half a million pounds, like what did you do next? Who were the members of the team that you needed to bring on board to make Concentric come to life? So I think the first thing we had to do was work out whether it was spam or not. And it was a Friday evening, so we, we, had, we had no good way to confirm whether this Innovate UK grant was genuine or not. So I remember kind of sitting around that weekend thinking, do we believe this? Do we, you know, is this really happening? But yeah, so then it was really about working out what that, what that actually looked like. So I left my job at Babylon, came back. I, I kind of wanted to set up a company in, in Wales. Uh, at this point, I had a, a, you know, my first daughter and um, was a few months old. So I was wanted to, you know, come back to Wales, set up a company in Wales. You know, I'm Welsh speaking. It's kind of a big part of, of who I am. And so just really proud to be able to do that. And then clearly super fortunate that my brother, Martin, Chief Technical Officer at Concentric, but had been a kind of serial CTO at other startups, but also public and private sector. So convinced Martin to come back and um, leave what he was doing at the time and set up Concentric together. And so we were two and then Ed being the, the, the other co-founder. So the story with Ed is probably worth kind of reflecting on. So I've talked about my kind of journey to here, but actually Ed's journey was kind of parallel and then we brought together. So I'd been building this aid memoir in South Wales and Ed had been building kind of e an electronic consent form um, and reasonably kind of simple. I think Ed would agree with, with that in its nature, but in some ways was, was tackling the same stuff. But I had tried not to take on the system. I was creating something that a junior doctor could kind of use without telling anyone. They were just kind of using it as an aid memoir. It's like two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Ed was kind of taking on the system by saying, yeah, we want to use this electronic form and we kind of want it to be embedded into the organization and, and all that kind of stuff. And so there was a period of time where we were introduced by Tony Young, who's a um, national clinical director for NHS England. And we were both on what's the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Program in the UK, a really interesting program, a program which powers clinicians to take ideas from the front line and, and try and make them a real thing. And so Tony said to us, well, you two guys are kind of doing the same stuff. You've been tinkering with this for a few years. We'd both started around 2012 with these different ideas. Um, and so Ed and I spent probably nine months working out whether we were friends or foe, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's courtship, really. It's business courtship. And it's totally, you know, it's, it's totally ridiculous in, in hindsight, right? There was, the, you know, two individuals tinkering around with like teeny tiny things. Like we were clearly not you know, competitors. So, and I think the, the balance that that has given us, so Ed has stayed working clinically. So Ed does a, a day a week with Concentric and four days a week as a consultant breast surgeon down in Portsmouth. And I think that has given us through this story, you know, from 2016 or so onwards, when we kind of brought, brought the two stories together, that ability for, you know, me to go and say, actually, I want to do this full time. And I think I need to be able to do it full time so that I can totally and utterly like live and breathe this product, but also have Ed really kind of within that setup as a co-founder, it just makes sure that we're never too far from the front line of, of like, actually, does that genuinely make sense? Like, even though I'm a clinician, you know, I've been out of normal clinical training off the wards for, for six or so years by now properly. It's easy to to drift away from the the reality of, as you say, the that system challenge that, you know, when... When a nice thought really clashes with the reality on the ground. Can you talk us through sort of how Concentric yeah. works? I mean, I'm imagining DocuSign, right? Like DocuSign applied to ethics with sort of a, your, the aid memoirs in a way that's very accessible for a new radiologist like me to consent for a procedure. But what, what does the process look like? Yeah, so I'm going to be controversial here and say we are absolutely not an e-signature platform. I know. So I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's yeah, baiting so, you. So lots of people will think that this is, you know, a way to have electronic signatures. And I will like totally and utterly categorically say the value here is not in collecting and collecting a signature. Like that is a trivial bit of technology. 
it's just not the value. So the value here is in really understanding systems and there's lots of complexity around consent and all the different ways that works. Huge amount of complexity in terms of data, in terms of outcomes, in terms of complications, in terms of all the different kind of templates for all the different treatments, all the complexity of being able to say, actually, it's, you know, actually, we're going to do this procedure and this procedure plus or minus this procedure. Like, what does that mean? You know, it's all the stuff that you cannot do in a PDF. You just literally cannot do as well as the total holy grail of actually making a difference in terms of decision making. So I have zero interest in creating a PDF form that is shown to be signed. Like that is not something that wakes me up in the morning. That is a functional thing. It, it does not have any impact. The impact here is giving clinicians and patients a platform that supports conversations, supports that kind of shared understanding so that patients have something they can say, actually, yeah, that kind of marries with what I've kind of been discussing. I can go back to it. I can deep dive into it. I can kind of see this in my own like, language and like clearly described for me. I can deep dive a little bit more. I can go into you know reading resources from other trusted sources that I want to. I can deep dive into a video and animation. I can actually get to grips with this decision because you know my pet hate is that patients not because they don't want to engage with the decision but feel they can't. So they come into a clinical conversation and say you know, I, well, I don't, you know, you tell me doctor and not because they totally trust the clinician and they just, you know, want the clinician to make the decision that most of the time is that they feel that they cannot engage with this decision. And so if we can give them, you know, tools and structures and support that conversation in a way that actually patients come into this conversation and stay in those conversations saying, yeah, I'm in this decision. This is a shared decision. I can totally engage with this you are supporting me as a clinician to make that decision, then we've totally changed the approach to clinical decision-making and all the evidence says that that is for the better. So there's so much data by now around the value of shared decision-making and involving, involving those two experts. So there's an expert clinician who knows, knows the medicine, knows the options, knows the pros and cons, and there's a patient who genuinely knows them, knows who they are, knows what's important, what the preferences are, and it's only in those with those two experts that you make good decisions. Um, and so, for me, a signature on a form is a necessity for the kind of functionality and, and the structures that we have. Certainly in the US, the UK, and lots of kind of ang- anglicised healthcare systems. But the value is not really that. It's not what underpins informed consent, right? And maybe that's a good place to start. And I'm not going to pretend to be the ethics expert here. So, Eric. Dav, maybe we can just walk through what informed consent is, what assessing capacity means, and then how Concentric addresses that. Well, I was just going to say, I loved a lot of things of what you said, but I, I mean, I love that the point that you're making about that you kind of have these two experts, right? They're two parts of the puzzle. Because I think that a lot of times around consent products, some people's gut reactions is like, well, a lot of my patients just defer to me, right? And say like, well, what, what do you think I should do, doc? But the important point there that you made And there's a lot of data to support is those patients tend to be people that feel like they are not able to engage with the information. And then when those people have been surveyed afterwards, they actually regret not being involved in the decision. It's not that they, it's not what they're saying, saying to people and people, I think some physicians rest on that of like, oh, well, I just, most of my patients just want me to make the decision for them. But that's, that's not, that's not actually true, even if that's what they're, they're saying at that first encounter. And I think that to your point, like that's the value here is you make that conversation or a bus conversation and empower people to make informed consent and informed choice. Yeah. And you can totally understand that behavior, right? These are people are, you know, trained all their lives really to think that, you know, hospitals are these really complex places, complex organizations, medicine is really complicated. And so most people's first touch with that is to think actually, you know, Particularly if, if this is a, a scary diagnosis, this is a, this is cancer, or it, it behaviorally, totally the natural thing there to say that, that I can't engage with that. I need to defer to someone. And so you, you're totally right in saying that if we can keep people on that on that journey with us um, and leverage their expertise as as an individual, then it 
allows us to make a decision that makes sense in hindsight and you know why that decision was made. And even if that's the wrong decision, even if you get a, you know, a, a bad outcome from that, if you know that you have been part of that decision and you were informed, then actually your future regret around that decision is, is far, far smaller. And the other thing is, you know, in terms of that point around individual tears, that we all make assumptions in life that are incorrect. And the systems that we work in often accelerate and accentuate that. So the system of having, you know, really short consultations, five minutes, 10 minute consultations mean that our brains are hardwired to try and make some assumptions um, so that you can get to the, your next appointment in 10 minutes, right? But there's some lovely data. I mean, it, the King's Fund is a, is a great organization in the UK that has done a huge amount of work around shared decision-making and Alf Collins as a, as a mentor to myself and the team were instrumental to some of that work. And you know, some really like clean examples of, of assumptions. So as a urologist, this kind of example um, kind of spoke to me when I, when I first read the paper a number of years ago. So when you look at patients considering a resection of the prostate, uh, you know, a, T or, a TURP as it kind of historically was, there's so many different options by now, but an asked patient, it asked clinicians about their, their assumptions of what would be important to patients in different deciles of age. Really simple one. So clinicians would naturally think that, you know, anything to do with erectile dysfunction was super, super important to, to men in their 50s and 60s who were considering a TURP, but almost certainly not important to, to 70 year olds and definitely not important to 80 year olds. And when you looked at that data, that was totally not true. That was an absolute assumption that we as clinicians had naturally made around sexual activity in, elder, you know, in the elderly population. And there was basically no difference in how important those patients in different deciles of age thought erectile dysfunction was. And it totally changed it, it totally changes the balance between, you know, conservative management, medical management, and surgical management in those different age groups. A you know, super simple assumption to make, which you could imagine all of us doing, right? We can all imagine making the assumption that actually you're an 85 year old. I probably can lean more towards surgical intervention because erectile dysfunction surely isn't a problem for you. And I'm probably not going to tackle it because I've got a 10 minute consultation, but it just wasn't true. And so it's just a really nice example for me of saying, you really do need that patient as an expert to be able to make good decisions. And if we're not making good decisions about what treatment to do as, as clinicians, then everything else that happens after that, you know, the surgical outcome, exactly how you do the operation, all of the stuff kind of downstream from that is almost irrelevant. Like make the right decision up front. I guess how does concentric then, because you, you have the digital thing and you're providing this information, how do you make sure that your information that you're providing is balanced in that way or aligned with what patients want to hear like how, how do you tackle that so like i'm joining a, a practice on the east coast of the united states so let's say that my practice wanted to incorporate concentric to help elevate for me you know interventional radiology procedures right so how does concentric balance the information they're providing for say like a pe thrombectomy or an ivc filter removal or something like that which would be more of my world so it's probably worth just walking through product a little bit just to make it a little bit clearer in people's minds what this looks like. So essentially the model here is that a clinician will select the treatment as simple or as complex as that needs to be, you know, single procedures, combined procedures, whatever that is, and then provide a template of information that a clinician can select or personalize, modify as much or as little as they need to. And then that can be presented to patients in one of a number of ways. So there's basically a kind of a patient view of the information like a cholecystectomy, like I'm getting a cholecystectomy and I select like cholecystectomy is the procedure and then it's going to provide a template for the patient about cholecystectomy. Yeah. So there's a template of information which has the indications for surgery, alternatives, anesthetic options, risk profiles, risk profiles divided into kind of when, how likely, um, and each of those kind of concepts in their different manners will have descriptions, signposting, can I edit it at all? Yeah. Can I change what's on there and like make it sort of specific to the patient I have in front of me? Yeah, exactly. So, so you can modify those to say, actually, you know, we know that, you know, this risk isn't relevant because, you know, we're not going to use a, a tourniquet or, you know, whatever that is, or actually I might know some specific data for you because I've looked at my own 
figures or looked at some joint registry data for you know the likelihood of mortality or re you know readmission or whatever for for your variables so you can kind of modify that you know add notes and all that kind of stuff and then it's shared with patients in one of a number of ways and i think one of the things i'm quite proud and pleased about in terms of the product is that we have built it in a way that is flexible to just so many different pathways so we see clinicians using that in consultation to kind of support the conversation to give that structure to be able to kind of say okay let's deep dive into that a little bit more look at that watch an animation whatever that is or you can share it with patients before they come into a consultation and that's definitely one of the the use cases that I quite like so that so that you know the emails the feedback that I quite like getting are our clinicians saying actually I'm now sending this information out to patients you know before I come into my consultation so that they've had time to digest some of that stuff. And so my 10 minute consultation now is not eight minutes of me giving a load of information and giving the same spiel that I've always given and I'm giving 10 times in a row in my clinic. But instead of that, I'm saying, actually, have you had an opportunity to look at the information? What were your thoughts? What were your questions? Let's actually have a conversation for 10 minutes rather than me give you information for eight minutes and then try and squeeze some valuable conversation into that last two minutes. So, you know, I quite like that model of, of sharing information and then and then coming off that information into a valuable conversation. So let's say like I get referred a new patient or whatnot for, and then I ask them to download an app or go to a certain website and then I can share with them the tailored information. So essentially a clinician will select the information, personalize that as much or as little as they need to. And then they will share a secure link with that patient, uh, which they access through their email or SMS. They can access that information, come back to as many times as they want to, share it with others. And then depending on the pathway and what's been enabled, then that information might just be read-only. So they've just got access to the information but can't document their consent because there's a kind of consent conversation to come next. Or if you've if you've had a conversation with a patient and you're happy that they can document their consent when they've had a look, then you can enable remote consent and then they can go through that pathway, you can sign their consent, you know, as well as any of those kind of peripheral consents around registries or biobanks or that kind of stuff in the comfort of their own home, totally, you know, not under pressure, not with someone else in the room. And that's definitely really appreciated by patients to be able to go through that process in their own time. Do you use that in oncology at all? So, you know, I have very vivid memories of watching the first time I watched the consent process for adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, And I distinctly remember the oncologist saying something along the lines of, this will decrease your risk of cancer coming back by tiny percentage. You know, this post-surgical patient. And I remember like sort of putting myself in that the patient's shoes being like, wow, that's a really tough decision to make. It was sort of young, yeah. female, still had lots of things to do to do in her life. And is was the risk benefit really there for this patient? I wasn't sure. Yeah. And so a really common model for us is that clinicians will have you know, a conversation, often might share a diagnosis in, a, in that consultation and then introduce some thoughts around treatment options, possibly with a treatment option that is probably the kind of preferred or probably the kind of most likely treatment option and then we'll share that information with them for patients to go through in their own time Mm. you need that time because otherwise like you as the the expert like how are you supposed to sort of process all the information that is related to to you when making that decision and in an oncology setting you know the evidence is so so clear around once you hear the word cancer in in a consultation your attention of anything post that moment is is so low so that is a very clear use case for us to be to say actually you're having that consultation and the system probably pushes you to like discuss some treatment options and things in that consultation because actually treatment needs to be soon and and getting you back into a clinic is tricky within that two week time frame and all that kind of stuff but at least let's give that decision some you know whatever you want to call it cooling off time or, or whatever, but that you can go and say okay right I've had that consultation. I don't really remember anything after the word cancer, but I'm now going to go and have a coffee and then I'm going to take a breather and then I'm going to get home and I'm going to get onto my favorite sofa and then I'm going to come back to this information and I'm going to go through it in my own time. And that's just, you know, we all know that that is a a much, much nicer position that we would want to be in 
rather than someone saying, okay, well, actually I need to book you in for this treatment next week. So I need you to sign this consent form. I know I've only just told you about the diagnosis four minutes ago, but you know, you, you can you sign here? Like the chances of you engaging in that decision, like going back to that idea of having as a patient, having to take off your you know, decision-making hat in that room, like we would all do the same, right? We'd be like, Christ, yeah, okay. I, I don't know, but you've given me a, a form I need to sign. It seems like the logical thing that I should do with a form that, I sh- that has a signature box there is to sign it. And so if we can move away from that and use that, you know, use the 99.99% of the time that a patient has in their pathway valuably, then it's just the obvious thing to do, right? I think that's a simple thing for me to say. And, and the data around shared decision making is, is, is surprisingly good. So as a bit of context, so I was working in Babylon four days a week and I was shared decision making lead for um, public health Wales alongside that for those two years. And, you know, that role was very much going out to different health boards and clinical teams and, and evangelizing around shared decision making. But the challenge always, you know, for me in that role was you would have a, a session and you'd kind of get the clinicians to the point where they, at the end of the session, were like, oh yeah, maybe I'm not doing this as well as I thought I was or, or, or could be doing. But as soon as you walk out of that room, the reality is that it's really hard not to revert to type as soon as you get into your kind of next clinic or your second clinic. And so, so that was the kind of context that I come from in terms of shared decision-making and some of the data that's been published from, so two papers from uh, Northwest London, from Imperial uh, last year, showing a really convincing impact on shared decision-making quality with the introduction of Concentric. And I think, I think it's fair to say that as a team, we were surprised that those impacts were so clear, partly because there's so many things on our product roadmap in terms of shared decision-making things that we just haven't done yet. We knew that coming in and in some ways, you know, in its simplest form, replicating a paper content form, that in its simplest way of describing is what we've done currently, right? But even, you know, doing what Concentric currently does has totally changed the numbers around shared decision-making quality. So one of the papers in the, in the surgeon showed a move from 28% of patients reporting gold standard shared decision-making you know, with the old paper process up to 72%. So from 28% to 72%, simply from digitizing a form as you could kind of describe it. And that's just really unusual in that shared decision-making literature. So usually the challenge in terms of that, in terms of the literature is that you can have some impact when there's a defined shared decision-making type project going on in an organization that's really like involved and there's lots of people evangelizing and lots of people pushing the message and increasing clinic times, all those kind of stuff that come with those quality improvement projects. But then often they will, you know, quite quickly slip away once those projects are, are not there anymore. So just really... And how did you measure it, Dav? What were the metrics that you measured at the point of asking patients whether or not that gold standard was met? So th- there are actually um, a couple of really well-validated scoring systems around shared decision-making. So one of them is Collaborate, which Glyn Elwin, who is Welsh by background, but is now based in the US and has done a lot of the work around shared decision making. So Collaborate is, is one score and then, which is kind of three questions that are asked after that treatment decision has been made about whether patients were involved in that decision, whether they were aware of alternatives and that kind of stuff. And then SDMQ9, which is slightly more in-depth, kind of nine domains uh, question. So, so nine questions across different domains. Um, and so, yeah, so those two papers, one used Collaborate, one used SDMQ9. So the STMQ9 one, for example, showed statistically significant improvement in all of those domains right across the piece. And, and so, yeah, that, those were asked by the trusts, by the, the healthcare organizations at, at a certain point. I can't remember exactly the dates, but they will be within the first couple of weeks after that consent conversation happened. And was that uh, with or without the, uh, the information or was it just the digitalized form? Yeah, no, so those are with Concentric pretty much as they are, as, as Concentric is now, right? So... So that was a bit of a mix of pathways, but always with access for the patients to to that information, you know, remotely before, or after, before and or after that um, content conversation. But yeah, there's always a you know, huge variation in terms of how much patients engage with that, and some will come back to it lots of times, some will kind of come back to it once. But yeah, so so it was it was pa- comparing paper process and um, generally a kind of carbon copy. You know, in the UK we we've historically used this kind of A three. Sort of big pieces of paper, which are carbon copy, which you 
scribble some indication, you know, some risks on the on the front. Scribble left or right, vaguely uh, readably on the front page, uh, and then the patient gets a copy behind, which invariably couldn't read at all. Or how do you cultivate the information? What's your source, I guess, to keep up and make the information balanced or to date? Or how do, how do you manage that part of it? Content is definitely a, a, a big, you know, it's a big thing. It's a big challenge. Just the vast, the vastness of it. So even as a surgical registrar, you get, uh, you know, you think there are these kind of X number of hundred procedures that could possibly exist. And then actually there's just, you know, so many so many things in, in each little subspecialty. And or even like outside your specialty, you know, like the, the option of not doing anything or especially outside your own, people are like, you know, experts on theirs and all that jazz. And, and you know, there's, there's the, all of the challenge of for each of those clinicians, their world is that like specialty or the, their, their subspecialty. So we, we will still have scenarios where, you know, there's a clinician who's doing a, a certain subspecialty and they're like, I can't believe you haven't got information for this and this and we're like yeah well you know there's a couple of thousand there um but yeah we haven't got to that one yeah but so it's a, it's a huge challenge and we have a can you make your own on the platform so you know if we were doing something rare or can, can you just use a blank template yeah so you can so you can create from blank so what we'll kind of do is that you you search for the thing so that if there is a template you use that one and then if you're not then you create from blank so the challenge that we have around creating from blank is that you know, we know that patients generally in this experience have an expectation around what information they'll be shared. So they have, you know, lay descriptions, they have other signposting and, it, and there's a lot of richness within that platform. And so there's, there's always been a bit of a balance from a, for us between clinicians being able to create something from blank that's quick enough that it functionally can work when it needs to be, but not getting to a point where you just have a, a line of clinical terms that doesn't mean anything to anyone. Because then it'd just be a paper consent form all over again. And what about what about assessing problems with like health literacy? You know, I've said this on the show before. I have lived, worked, and continue to work in East London, an incredibly diverse population. I would say in my years that over thirty percent of my consultations have significant a significant degree of sort of communication impairment. What what are Concentric doing to address this? Yeah. So the first thing to say is that Concentric does not replace that consultation that conversation with clinicians so this is not you know saying well actually it was really hard to have this conversation because of a language barrier or, or whatever and so i'm just going to give them this consent information so that i can kind of get rid of that problem it, it definitely doesn't get rid of that problem because you know this is not a consent process is not just giving consent information the really valuable piece of that process is the conversation so our aim is definitely not to get to a point where you can replace that but you can support that so in many ways, digital allows us to to do this in, in kind of quite straightforward ways. So firstly, just accessibility stuff. So being a web application means that there's just loads of stuff that come out of the box, right? We can use all of the browser accessibility tools around you know, font sizes, colors, high contrast stuff, all of that kind of stuff. And the other big part of this is around language translation. So for the first kind of few years, we were kind of struggling working out where we sat on translation. But increasingly, I'm of the view that the kind of automated ML model translations are just getting so good by now that uh, we can leverage that to say, actually, this content can really easily be translated into, you know, if you're using Chrome, it's, you know, 110 languages, as it were, right at the box. To rephrase my question, I guess I was also the digital literacy and sort of the the level that you need to pitch a conversation. That, again, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'll never forget one day when on a psychiatry ward when I handed a patient written information and they just looked at me blankly like I, I can't read and from that that now you just, just can't make any assumptions yeah no absolutely and and you know in each of those scenarios there needs to be a different approach right so um in that scenario it may have been that some accessibility tools would have helped because you know you can do read aloud within browsers and so you can spoken language through those things to, to supplement the conversation that you've had. But equally, you know, the flip side of that is, is, is the whole conversation around, you know, digital access devices. There are in, in all communities and, and we have a lot of people who say, well, you know, yes, you could, you know, you could get this to work at X hospital, but we're totally different. You know, we've got a totally different population. The reality is that there's 
digital exclusion, di- digital challenges for, for each of these communities and for lots of different reasons. So it's not just it's not just an age thing. It's not just a deprivation thing. It's, it's a whole gamut of all sorts of different things. And so you need different solutions for different people. So in terms of that device exclusion you know, part, actually there it's just a matter of saying you need access to the information. And so you, know, you can print this information and share that with them. So that is always going to be a backstop for any digital tool is that, you know, particularly content-based digital tools, you can always print that information and they have access to that content. But we try and keep the process digital regardless. So one of the questions that we kind of often have around that digital exclusion point is that, okay, fine. So this process works for 90%, but then we need to have a different process for, you know, 10%. But what I say is that actually operationally, you need the simplicity of single processes through a hospital. Otherwise, there's all sort of, sorts of complexities that happen and things get lost and errors occur. So we try and keep the process digital regardless of the patient, but exactly what that looks like will depend on the patient. So for those who are totally comfortable you know, with digital and doing things remotely and they've got devices at home, then you'll see lots of use of remote consent where they go through the information consultation, share that with them, go through it remotely. They do that in their own time. And there are others where actually you need to go through that process with them in clinic and they'll, they'll sign in clinic. That'll be kind of fine. And then they have access to the information at home, but they don't need to kind of sign from home. And then there's others that you'll complete the process, kind of get the, the electronic signature as it were in clinic, but then say, actually, okay, we know that it's valuable for you to come back to this information to understand it. Actually, often to come back to that information post-op so that they can say, actually, should I be expecting this complication? Should I be alerting anyone to this? So we see a decent amount of use of this information digitally or in paper and um, post-op as well. So it's just flexing that process to to the needs of that individual. And I, you know, certainly for content-based digital tools, printing that information is a very easy way to do that. I mean, it makes sense. You're kind of, I mean, you're elevating the standard and then you're always going to have, I guess, situations as long as you build in some flexibility for how people can interact with it. Right. I mean, be it like maybe they're not signing it digitally and that you're printing it for them or reading aloud functionality, things like that. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I use the example of, you know, I'm clearly pretty comfortable with digital rights that, you know, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a surprise, but there are some documents, some things that I, that I print out to read because I want to read it on paper or I want to make notes on it or I want to scribble on it. And so it's just being flexible with that and, and understanding that different mediums will work for different people in terms of, you know, how things are read. And that might mean that a 23 year old, super technical, you know, super, I'm not 23, that's me using a different person who's, you know, totally technically comfortable might also want a paper copy of this information because that's how they want to engage with it. I take it that you try and make then the language kind of at that average reading level and with like health numeracy that things like, you know, one in 10 people means more to people than 10%, stuff like that. Yeah, totally. So, so there are some kind of standards that we try and meet around literacy. So what we aim for is a, is a kind of age 12 literacy in, in the UK. That's the, the kind of the balance that we can get to because we know that there are some challenges around kind of medical terms and procedure names that are, you know, just really challenging to simplify. We give the context, we give the lay description alongside it, but that's the kind of, that's what we try and we aim for in terms of the, the kind of readability age the readability scores yeah super important to to consider that and i mean just before we wrap up eric i'd love to sort of hear your thoughts would you use this in your practice you know how do you see this particularly being a benefit to interventional radiologists for example if you don't mind me asking you a question no i think it'd be great i mean because like the interventional initiative i guess the nonprofit that i'm part of has been doing more of an analog version of this, but I think the the power of concentric with the digital approach is just the flexibility of it and the ease allow it to be used in real time as well as, you know, ahead of time or after. I really love that aspect of it. So yeah, I, I would definitely be interested. I don't know what your interventional radiology platform looks like, but yeah, I have a lot of balance information or we do through that organization uh, with interventional radiology procedures. But interventional radiology in particular is annoying just because there's less data behind it. And so people are all across the board in terms of what they say to people in terms of risks, benefits, everything else. So as a specialty would definitely benefit from a little bit more standardization in the information that we share to patients. And then 
it's just an obscure specialty that a lot of people haven't heard of. So that that knowledge gap tends to be a lot larger for us than, you know, people have heard of a heart attack. So if you're talking about a heart attack and I'm blocking, opening up blood vessels as a cardiologist, it's a little more accessible to people than like a tips. There's such a big knowledge gap of having to explain like cirrhosis and then there's a backup and then there's this tube and we're going to go through the neck and it's a lot of, lot of things. So I, I definitely think it's, I'm sold on it is what I'm trying to say, but in many <laughs> words. <laughs> oh, would, it, would it be fair to say that, you know, another particular challenge in IR is the fact that IR is a B2B business as opposed to a B2C business in, in the first sense, right? We get referred patients and I know that, you know, as a specialty, we're moving towards being more clinical. But today, the status quo is that we receive referrals from physicians that have already sort of got a request or a treatment option in mind. So what kind of ethical challenges does does that bring when discussing alternative treatments? Because now you don't just have the patient as a stakeholder and an expert. You're an expert as an IR, but there's also, you know, the referring physician. How do they fit into the puzzle? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like 50-50 for us. In the outpatient world, we function a lot more like any procedural or surgical specialty. And the inpatient world is where it gets a little sticky because we're often seen as a Hail Mary pass of healthcare and we're not the person that knows that person best, you know? And so it's hard to roll in. And, you know, if everyone has decided like this person needs X procedure and you come in as like, uh, honestly, this is, you know, approaching futility, that's usually where the ethical thing comes. And then the other part of it that I think you're alluding to is more of the turf war thing, right? Like we were talking about T-U-R-P, right, for like benign prosthetic hyperplasia, hypertrophy, or what about like prostate artery embolization, right? Like there's, we as a specialty tend to make ways of doing things that other people are already doing. So turf wars and interspecialty tensions becomes a thing, particularly if it's like a fee-for-service model. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely politics, but that's not necessarily unique to IR. I think it's just that we do overlap with a lot of specialties. I think every specialty has a little bit of that. That's why I was actually alluding to earlier where it's, like people are really good at talking about what they do, but there's actually a lot of data to say the thing that people, the alternatives in consent that we tend to forget to talk about as much as what other specialties do or the option of not doing anything, which going back to that futility thing is that we'll come and talk to you about that third biliary drain for obstruction so that you can get more chemotherapy when you're, you know, obtunded and everything else at the end of life. But we often forget to mention that a lot of people just don't want that third drain or anything. And what does that look like? So I, there's a lot of facets there. That wasn't like a direct answer. It's just that I, I, I think that it's a complex issue, consent and interactions with other specialties. And that's why I find this really empowering is, is it going to solve all the problems with consent? No, there's, there's tons of things out there, but I think it at least elevates it and lets people have a more robust conversation in, I think, in any specialty. So just from that perspective, so I think this very simply from a from an IR perspective in concentric, so concentric is generally brought in as the consent mechanism across an organization. So that's like all specialties, including interventional radiology, you know, oncology, cardiology, you know, surgical specialties, it's right across that piece. But yeah, the the other thing that I've definitely seen as part of concentric deployments is that it is often seen as an opportunity to revisit those pathways. So it's actually not an uncommon conversation for me to have with teams and deploying organizations around interventional radiology because interventional radiology has changed so much in terms of what is within its kind of remit over the last 15 years. It's gone from mostly a transactional specialty where you say, actually, this procedure needs to be done. I kind of do it to say, actually, it's, it's broader. It's kind of eating into much more of that kind of surgical stuff, as you say, like, the prostate artery embolization is a, is a great example of saying, well, there used to be this like surgical thing and actually we're bringing in IR stuff. So we will often see people certainly exploring whether introducing concentric is an opportunity to also look at those pathways. And IR is one of the places that conversation comes up because the last time they thought about consent pathways and IR might have been 10 years ago. And then bringing concentric in means they need to think about it anyway. And so they go, oh, actually, our context is quite different now, 10 years later than it was then. And so we have seen some places bring in some more consent clinics, some more formality in terms of that decision-making decision -making conversation with an interventional radiologist that is not happening within the procedure room. 
And curious, have you ever considered sort of introducing concentric into like an MDT? So I don't know, I'm imagining a future where at every tumor board or multidisciplinary discussion, a concentric pops up for each patient to be like, have we considered all the options available to them? And whoever's going to do the consent, can they make sure that they actually talk about this discussion? Because that that is something that in my days in vascular surgery would, would frustrate me because I was like, well, you have, we haven't told them what else is potentially an option here. Like the tumor board edits the the option? I don't know. You're in a tumor board and it, as part of that discussion, concentric pops up. So you have to sort of input some some data at that point. Yeah. So I think that there's, there's, there's different parts for that. So what we are doing currently is saying, you know, actually there's a, there's a preferred treatment which has a nod to the alternatives. And so it kind of add some structure around those alternatives. And so probably as part of that, to a certain extent, there is a little bit more kind of, it brings it into that process that clinicians are discussing alternatives in consent conversations. So it's probably slightly more at the forefront, particularly of, of some things, you know, we often see clinicians saying, oh yeah, I never actually talk about that as an alternative, but yeah, that's a good point. I probably should. So, you know, that probably feed through to some of those, those MDT conversations. But you know, as you say, there are a number of things on our on our roadmap which fit more classically into that kind of shared decision making space. So, you know, earlier in the process, before uh, there's a preferred treatment option, and and a part of that is the kind of MDT process that comes before a consent conversation. And just as a little pet project that I just spent a bit of time on almost a decade ago. Wouldn't it be nice to involve patients in those MDT conversations because the same principles apply here, right? Um, if you've got five, six, ten clinicians discussing what the right options are, if you don't have the expert patient in the room, then there's a decent chance you won't come up with the right kind of decisions, options, won't be discussing in the right context for that patient. So I actually did a, a project a number of years ago where we tried to bring patients into into an MDT conversation and re- really challenging. I mean, it was, there was a, a huge amount of pushback to that. And, and in the end, we didn't manage to get to a point in that project of, of getting patients to kind of come in or call in. But we did get to a point where we had patients recording a little clip of themselves um, at home, sharing a bit of like their story um, in those MDTs because you know, we've all sat in MDTs where you have like 40 patients. There is no way by the, by that 38th patient that you have any recollection of the 10th patient. And it's pretty hard to be able to remember if, if the thing you've just heard was something to do with the 38th patient or 37th patient. So anything you can do to bring that, bring that patient into the room, make that patient kind of an actual like thing that people can visualize and think about. To totally humanize them. So yeah, I, I actually remember one really good example of an oncology patient patient who the oncologist had only ever seen like as an inpatient and in the in the context of them being an inpatient. And then they were having a, a, an MDC conversation after discharge to kind of work out like, you know, subsequent treatment options. And this patient sent a video in of him on a tractor and um, like doing some farming whilst he did this like 20 second clip. And I just remember that, like the, the moment in the room of being like, oh God, that, that's like, it's totally changed my perception of like, of this patient and what we, how we should be thinking about this patient. I'm repeating my pitch, but they look for opportunities to involve patients in those, in those decisions. And when you do, A, those decisions get better, but also your role as a clinician is more enjoyable because you can actually have like proper conversations, not just spend your whole time just saying, saying the same old things, the same old risks, the same old like spiel that you've always given in those consultations. That's a wonderful tagline. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, we're all very well aligned with this. And I hope that, you know, if you're listening to this on, on the way into hospital today, what can you do to involve your patient? What can you do to help facilitate that process of shared decision making? And, you know, if it's been a long time since you've read the definition of informed consent you can just pop it into google or ask chat gpt to read it out loud to you as as a quick refresher of uh something that really is critical to our role as physicians so thank you very much it was a pleasure to have you on the show learn about concentric and thanks also to eric for being a wonderful co-host and we will see you next time
Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Backtable Innovation on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable Innovation is produced and hosted by Brian Hartley, Aaron Fritz, Diana Velasquez-Pimentel, and Eric Amaker. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.